purpose. Now we're changing subject. Again, a scientific contribution. We're going to hear from uh, Dr. Ulrich Klotz. Ulrich Klotz got his uh, degree in physical metallurgy at the Stockard Univ uh, University. He has a PhD in material sciences at the Polytechnic of Zurich in Switzerland. He is the manager of the physical metallurgy department at the FEM in Schwizbund, Germany. The subject matter of his presentation is that of amorphous platinum alloys for jury making. This paper introduces a new class of platinum alloys with completely different features vis-a-vis -vis the conventional alloys. Amorphous metallic materials for precious materials are very important for jewelry and watchmaking because of their scientific characteristics. Uh, this uh, Here we have uh, the combination of uh, uh, microcasting with uh, uh, conventional coating. Um, having said as much, I'd like to invite Mr. Fr Dr. Klotz here. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the kind introduction. I'm speaking about bulk metallic glasses. We heard a little bit about it from in the presentation of Chris Corti. And uh, this is a work together, uh, we did together with uh, the colleagues at FEM in Stuttgart. Um, and I recognize that I was speaking here in 2014 uh, already about bulk metallic glasses, that time gold bulk metallic glasses, and this time um, I will speak about platinum bulk metallic glasses. Now I will first uh, start with an introduction. What are bulk metallic glasses? We heard already a little bit, but I will go a little bit deeper into that. And we will have a second presentation after me by Owain, and he will also uh, go into uh, the physical metallurgy of the bulk metallic glasses, which is different from conventional um, metallic materials. Um, then I would like to explain the alloy compositions of bulk metallic glasses made of platinum alloys. Uh, these are special alloy compositions. I will show how we prepare the alloys and then uh, how we made uh, some jewelry pieces using investment casting processes. And of course, I will show you some jewelry examples that we uh, presented. We had the chance that one of our colleagues uh, was a master goldsmith and uh, he made these parts at FEM. So what is the bulk metallic glass? This diagram shows you the properties of uh, metallic material as a function of temperature. And we see uh, in the lower graph, this is the volume as a function of temperature and the blue curve shows what happens with the melt when, it, when you cool it. When you reach the melting temperature, there is a sudden drop of volume uh, during the crystallization, and this sudden drop of volume causes the shrinkage porosity that we know from uh, casting processes. But bulk metallic glasses do not show such uh, a sudden drop of uh, volume. Instead, they show a continuous shrinkage until um, the uh, glass transition temperature is reached, and after that, uh, the, the volume change is even slower. So uh, due to this continuous and slow change of volume with decreasing temperature, there will be no shrinkage porosity when cooling these alloys. Well, and the material is not crystallizing. Therefore, there is no crystallization uh, shrinkage. But instead, the viscosity of the melt, which is plotted here, is steadily increasing and it's uh, with decreasing temperature it's exponentially increasing so the material gets somehow solid although the this structure which this amorphous structure um, is still there and we call this amorphous amorphous means there is no crystalline structure and we also call it glassy because glasses the conventional glasses we know uh, window glasses also have this structure but a metallic glass, of course, is not transparent. A metallic glass looks like a normal metal. So in order to reach these special properties, we have to cool very fast. 
And uh, a second diagram here shows uh, the, the temperature over the time. And this is plotted on a logarithmic scale. And it happens, uh, it shows, uh, uh, this red curve shows what, what happens to the material when you cool it with this temperature time profile. So at a liquidus temperature, usually we expect the material to uh, become crystalline. But when you're quick enough, you can avoid this crystal, this, this, the green area is the, the crystalline uh, region. When you're quick enough, you can pass by this crystalline uh, field and the material st uh, uh, stays amorphous, like in the liquid phase. And then at a certain temperature, it re the, the glass transition temperature, it gets to the glassy state. Now, most metals don't show this. And uh, yeah, just this image uh, is showing this amorphous structure. It's uh, promoted by several atoms of different uh, kind, um, this irregular amorphous structure. So most metals are not doing this. It's uh, the effect of bulk metallic glasses is only known since the 1960s because in order to, to pass by this crystalline uh, nose, uh, you have to cool extremely fast. So for a metallic glass, you have to have 100,000 to 1 million kelvins per second, which is extremely fast. And then you can only reach 50, 50 micron thick uh, material. But when you want to have it bulk, so massive, uh, thicker, uh, this has to happen at much lower cooling rates, only 100 to 1,000 Kelvin per second. And then you can reach about one millimeter um, amorphous material, and then we call it bulk metallic glass. Now here are uh, some critical cooling rates, we call this, that are required to form the bulk metallic uh, properties. And we see that for gold-based bulk metallic glasses, we have 18 Kelvin, for platinum, 2.5 Kelvin per second. And for palladium, we have only 0.16 Kelvin per second, which is quite slow cooling. And therefore, we can reach really high thicknesses in this uh, palladium bulk metallic glasses. Gold requires quite high cooling rate, platinum, palladium quite low, and platinum is in between. And just for comparison, if you quench into a copper mold, you can reach about 100 to 200 Kelvin per second as a cooling rate. So this is required for gold, bulk metallic glasses, but for platinum, we hope to also do this by investment casting. What is Important is to have a high purity of uh, the melt because all um, impurities will act as nucleation sites for the crystals and so reduce the, the critical thickness that you can reach um, uh, during quenching. Now some properties of bulk metallic glasses, why are they interesting or what is special with, with their properties? is shown in this plot. This shows the strength as a function of uh, the elasticity. And we see several groups of materials, steels, titanium alloys, so classical conventional metals. They have high strength and a very low elastic limit. Usually we define 0.2% as the elastic limit in most uh, materials. We see some non-metallic materials like silica, wood, or polymers, they have uh, much lower strength, but polymers have really high elastic limits of about two to even nearly 3%. So this is, we, we know it, uh, and, and rubber is, is even more, we know that, that the material is soft and can be bent forth and back without being deformed. And bulk metallic glasses show also very high elastic limit, quite comparable to uh, poly, uh, to polymers materials. So this is really unique for metallic materials and this is uh, therefore uh, quite interesting, these very different properties. How can we use it? Now, uh, to reach these uh, special properties, we have to use special compositions. We heard in the presentation from Chris Corti that some elements are not really beneficial in uh, jewelry alloys, for instance, high amounts of silicon, 
germanium, um, phosphorus. Um, but especially these elements are interesting to make bulk metallic glasses because what do these elements do and why they are, are usually critical? They form so-called low melting eutectic compositions. So this diagram shows um, sections of phase diagrams. So it's a collection of different binary phase diagrams and it shows uh, the reduction of the, of the melting point by this element. So for instance, bismuth here um, at about 45% reduces the melting point of pure platinum to only about 750 degrees. Now we want alloys with uh, a fineness of uh, ideally 950 platinum or at least 850 platinum, which can be hallmarked. And if we look at this uh, diagram, we see that especially phosphorus, boron, and silicon are interesting. And with phosphorus, we can lower the melting point below 600 degrees C, which is yeah, 1,000, nearly 1,200 degrees lower than conventional platinum, which is extreme. So what Chris mentioned, uh, Chris Corti mentioned before, the high melting point of uh, platinum alloys is dramatically reduced. And um, of course, this is also interesting in terms of the processing, because uh, some arguments uh, for, uh, that you have for melting and casting platinum, high stability of the refractories, etc., are probably not true anymore if you can lower the temperature that much. But you have to be have to keep in mind these elements are not critical, uh, are very critical. If it crystallizes, um, it's not good. It will be very brittle. So we see some chances and challenges of the bulk metallic glasses. They have very special properties, the very high elasticity. Thermoplastic forming was mentioned by Chris Corti as well. I will not go into depth in, in this. Um, it's a special process. But on the other hand, there are some challenges, the very, very narrow composition ranges, the risk of imprittling if they are crystallizing, and of course the high cooling rate to reach the, the amorphous structure. And of course this material is highly experimental. There are only very few companies that are uh, nowadays producing uh, such material. So in this work, we want to establish a processing route for this platinum-based bulk metallic glasses. And uh, we want to demonstrate the feasibility under semi-industrial uh, conditions by working with uh, conventional materials uh, that you know from uh, uh, your practice. So let's have a look at the platinum-based alloys we worked with. We were focusing on platinum-based bulk metall metallic glasses that are based on platinum phosphorus alloys. And uh, this is a phase diagram of platinum and phosphorus. And I uh, told you about the dramatic reduction of the liquidus temperature, which you, th this line here is the liquidus line. And uh, there is this eutectic composition and the uh, red area uh, marks the interesting composition range of these alloys. Now this is in atomic percent, 20 to 25 or 18 to 25 atomic percent. And because phosphorus is much lighter than platinum, it's only about uh, uh, two to five or six mass percent of uh, platinum that we are uh, needing. Uh, there are uh, two alloys that are um, studied um, um, better, and this is uh, one alloy with 850 platinum, um, but uh, it, it, uh, and, um, it's nickel-free, that's important. And there is a 950 platinum alloy, but this shows a very low critical uh, thickness. So therefore, uh, we were uh, studying two alloys. We, I call it alloy A and B. Alloy A is the alloy with 85 uh, mass percent of uh, platinum. It contains uh, copper and uh, around 2% uh, 
uh, of uh, phosphorus. And uh, it has a liquidus temperature uh, quite low, below uh, 600 degrees, extremely high hardness, and it has a critical thickness of 7 millimeters. So this means this is the maximum thickness that you can, uh, where you can cast the alloy uh, under ideal cooling conditions. So 7 millimeters is a lot for most or enough for most jewelry objects if they are made by, by casting. Um, and the density is, of course, much lower than conventional platinum, which has, uh, it's only about 15 uh, grams per cubic centimeter. The second alloy has better glass forming ability. It has around uh, 74 mass percent. You can also have it with 75. Um, it contains also copper and it contains 5% nickel and much more uh, phosphorus. The other properties are quite similar, but the critical thickness is much higher. But of course, the nickel-free alloy would be much more interesting for jewelry application. There is a, uh, these alloys were developed um, yeah, nearly 20 years ago by Schröers, and um, there, some of them are commercially available uh, in Germany by a small company. So when we do alloy preparation, uh, and we have to work with uh, phosphorus, um, so that's uh, a bit tricky. Because phosphorus is highly reactive, especially if it forms white phosphorus. White phosphorus is highly toxic, and uh, it must be avoided that white phosphorus is forming. Uh, therefore, when you you cannot simply put it into an open graphite crucible and melt it because all the phosphorus will evaporate, will transform into white phosphorus, and uh, so you have to be careful what you're doing. So don't repeat these experiments in your lab at home, and um, uh, better uh, ask for some assistance who, with, uh, by someone who worked with these alloys already. What is also important, I mentioned impurities. So um, you can work with high purity uh, raw material, no problem usually with uh, um, precious metals. Uh, but um, often in laboratory or in, in scientific li literature, it's described that you need to flux these alloys. So fluxing means you put the alloy, the, the, the cast part, uh, and cover it with boron oxide. Then you melt the, the boron oxide and you, you boil it at 1,200 degrees for 16 hours, so quite a long and time-consuming and energy-consuming process. And of course, working with boron oxide is also not nice. Uh, it's uh, also not uh, very healthy. And we wanted to avoid this process uh, because uh, it's, uh, we think it's not practical um, if someone wants to produce these alloys. So therefore, we started uh, melting in a conventional um, uh, induction heated casting machine. We uh, used high purity chemical elements. We um, apply them in a, in a special way to avoid the uh, sublimation of the, of the phosphorus and to allow the alloying of, uh, of this. And we try this first with small batches of a few grams and then later on increased it up to 200 grams. We end up with a small uh, pre-alloyed ingot. This ingot is still chemical inhomogeneous, so we cut, uh, we cut the discs on, on either side and uh, measure the phosphorus content, and it was not homogeneous, and because the phosphorus content is so decisive, we uh, need to remelt uh, the material in a second try. But it's quite convenient to alloy the material this way in a closed machine. Then for Casting trials, we uh, prepared uh, some uh, CAD files. We 3D printed the objects, and then we did the conventional investment uh, process. We put some thermocouples inside uh, the, um, the flask to monitor the, um, the temperature. 
uh, the heat up of the flask because uh, we have to have a, a quite high cooling rate. And then we did some instrumented casting trials. We see the, the flask on the rotating arm of a centrifugal casting machine uh, with the, the thermocouple wires going to a data logger uh, which is mounted on the arm. So during spinning, it can uh, record the temperature profiles in the flask. So this is how, how we arranged all the thermocouples to, uh, with, a, with a defined distance from, from the wax part uh, to determine uh, the, the cooling rate in, uh, in our tree. And we also monitored the temperature of the melt with a, a, a thermal imaging camera. We see the, you see the heating. Uh, range. Um, we, we have different temperatures plotted here. The, the blue line is the crucible temperature, the red curve is the maximum temperature, and the pink curve is the, the average uh, temperature in the, uh, of the melt. So we go around to 1000 degrees, then you see nothing happens, uh, normal cooling, and then uh, we have a certain uh, undercooling and then the crystallization uh, occurs uh, during uh, cooling and then when we heat the material again we see the melting occurs. This is the conventional um, uh, heating cooling cycle and this demonstrates that the alloy has reached uh, the, the right composition because uh, the temperature is in the right range for casting. Then after the second heating we uh, switch the induction off and then we, we cast at, uh, in this case, at around 1000 uh, degrees. We did two casting trials. I already told you about the centrifugal casting and we also did uh, tilt casting trials. Why did we do so? Because the, you have to prevent the crystallization. There are impurities, there is the high cooling rate, but there is another factor, which is the so-called shearing of the melt. When you uh, um, cast the melt in centrifugal casting, you have a high shearing rate, and this shearing rate, it's uh, plotted in, in red. The, this is the shearing rate uh, during, during filling. You see that it's quite high during centrifugal casting and quite low during tilt casting, and the high shearing promotes the crystallization. So therefore, we first thought, well, we want to do it in tilt casting, but in the end, it was working also in centrifugal casting in gold. This was our experience from the gold alloys. In gold, this was critical, but it's not critical for platinum alloys. Now, this is a, a, a video, so could you please play the, the video? So you see the melt coming up and shooting into uh, the mold. It's done very quick. Um, and we saw, if you, if you look the time, maybe you can play it again. If you look at the, the time here in seconds, you see form filling is really fast. And uh, then it takes around two seconds uh, to reach uh, temperatures where the material uh, solidifies or becomes amorphous. Um, we, oops. We did the same. Uh, this is uh, um, the, the measurement of the temperatures. We, uh, we uh, had the simulation, which is the solid lines, and the, and the, um, uh, and uh, and there is uh, no. Th these are the, the the dotted lines are the simulations, and the and the solid lines, the, the thicker lines, are the measurements. And we see that there is a, a quite good. Um, um, uh, agreement between the calculation and uh, the simulation. You see the thermocouples after the casting sticking to the parts and uh, we obtained uh, a defect-free uh, casting. Then we tried a small tree with uh, small grids and, uh, and some rings. Uh, we did some metallography. We found that there is a porosity in, in some parts, very small scattered porosity, uh, but no major porosity and uh, no, no severe shrinkage. This uh, uh, poor surface here uh, is from, from our simple uh, 3D printer. Uh, we used an FDM printer in that case. 
So that was quite promising. So then we uh, did a gravity pouring simulation. So could you also please play this video? We see the melt is pouring um, and uh, filling takes uh, longer. And uh, you see all the gas bubbles uh, coming up. Um, uh, and it, it takes uh, about yeah 1.1 seconds until uh, the melt becomes um, about maybe you can play it again until the the melt becomes uh, uh, stable. Okay. Um, then the the same result for for this tree. Uh, we, we also see a quite good agreement between um, uh, the thermocouples uh, and the simulation. Now, um, this video shows uh, the, uh, the work in, in the laboratory. Could you please start? So this is a view to our laboratory. My colleagues, uh, Eike and Lisa, uh, who were uh, doing a casting trial um, in the centrifugal casting machine. And uh, so there are some thermocouples on it. Um, and uh, then it was uh, de-wested in water. And it was a, a quite filigree ring that we cast this time. Uh, it was a better quality of a 3D printed part that we uh, made on a Formlab machine. And, uh, here you see the part and uh, the, the resin part and the cast part. And we really got very good form filling and very filigree items with, that were uh, reproduced very well. The surface is very smooth. Um, so uh, this, this material casts really very well. But now you should set a stone here. And uh, I said uh, settings, uh, the material is very elastic, but not plastically deformable. So a conventional stone setting like this is, uh, is not possible. We knew this before, but we, we wanted to test this for the filigree items. So therefore, we had to think about um, a stone setting. And uh, uh, Ikev is, uh, as I said, is a master goldsmith, and uh, he had a, a great idea. He uh, wanted to use the elastic properties by uh, mounting a spring-loaded stone. So this is a cast ring. And uh, yeah, the edges are, you can use them as springs. But actually, these, these two sides of the ring were bent over each other to mount the stone. So uh, in the, uh, before casting, the right side was the left side and vice versa. So you had to bend the rings, uh, the, the, the ends over each other and something you cannot do with a conventional material, you would just bend the ring, but because the material is so springy, uh, it's, uh, it's working really well to, um, to fix the stone like this. If you look at the surface of the ring, you see the 3D printed and the cast surface and you get a perfect uh, representation of the surface. So the form filling ability uh, is uh, really very good. Then we tried another example. This was uh, a small sphere. Um, it has uh, yeah, maybe 10, 15 millimeters in diameter. You see the uh, 3D printed parts. It has a, a mesh structure um, on the surface and uh, um, we could cast it uh, without problems. Uh, it was filling very well. This is uh, the cast part. You see, again, the surface is already looking very good. And this is after finishing. And uh, this part was indeed amorphous. We proved this by X-ray diffraction. So the, uh, if the, the X-ray diffraction pattern in a, of a crystalline material usually shows sharp peaks, if these sharp peaks are missing, this is an indication of, uh, of the amorphous state. And, and this is the case here. There is no sharp peak here. There's a, uh, yeah, this, broad, uh, this broad peak. So uh, that was, uh, was a nice example. And um, yeah, this video shows the elasticity. 
So you see that this ring is, uh, is drawn, and uh, maybe you uh, play it again. Um, you see it's deforming elastic elastically to a really high extent and uh, without uh, being plastically deformed. So that's really fascinating again. And, uh, and then we had this little ball and we started playing with it. And uh, yeah, you can throw it on the ground and uh, Lisa is uh, throwing it on the ground in this video. So could you please start? So it's hard to see. As you see how it's, it's bouncing up and uh, it's, it's really bouncing like a rubber ball. So it was great fun to play with it. We played with it until it broke. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's really fascinating. So it's, uh, you throw it on the ground, of course not, not heavily, but it, it, it bounces back and you can, you can uh, catch it at, this, uh, at the same height. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, really fascinating. And um, so what is going on? Um, uh, we recognize that uh, we need to have more fundamental studies to better understand the alloy properties. So we have to study this phase diagram in more detail. The original phase diagram is nearly 100 years old. And so it, after over 90 years, it deserves some attention uh, to be studied again. And uh, we also um, made a powder of this alloy. So we used an uh, atomizer, um, plasma atomization, ultrasonic assisted plasma atomization uh, to atomize this uh, bulk metallic glass. Uh, you could, uh, you get uh, perfect spheres, very nice uh, powder. And uh, we also used um, laser tracks uh, on, on amorphous plates uh, on, on crystalline plates and, uh, and uh, made laser tracks on the surface and we recognized that the material was becoming amorphous due to the fast heating. So this was uh, um, a first work for maybe another interesting study uh, about the additive manufacturing of uh, um, such bulk metallic glasses based on platinum. Yeah, so this leads me to the summary. Bulk metallic glasses have fascinating properties. They are very highly elastic. They have high strength and hardness, uh, very low melting temperature, uh, which uh, makes them perfect for casting. Uh, if you reach the, the sufficient cooling rate, which we did by investment casting with conventional investments. There are different alloy compositions that behave uh, different. The, Best glass former is the one with uh, around 750 platinum. The higher the platinum content, the lower the glass forming ability is. Um, and uh, it can, after casting, it can be uh, finished in uh, standard techniques and uh, um, to produce really high quality uh, surfaces. So with this, I want to um, thank my project partners um, from University of Saarland in Germany, uh, my colleagues at, at FEM. Uh, we have an industrial users committee that was accompanying and supporting this work. I would also like to thank them and of course uh, the, for the financial uh, um, support by the German uh, government. And I thank Legor Group for inviting me and having the opportunity to giving this talk here. And thank you very much for your attention. Grazie mille, Ulrich. Grazie per la presentazione. Many thanks, uh, Ulrich.